Good morning, Pastor Brian Sixby. I'd like to welcome you to our live stream worship this weekend. Uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm back at home, back at the church, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to First United Methodist Church, Fox Hill, uh, for this worship service. Uh, the season from Pentecost on is, is a season of growth. It's a season of uh, renewal. It's a season of green. If you notice, the, uh, the pyramids in the church are going to be green uh, following Pentecost Sunday. Uh, so as we enter into the season, I encourage you to, to think about how you're growing, how you're developing, how uh, your life is expanding. Sometimes it feels like we're going backwards when actually we are going forward. So uh, keep all that in mind and uh, please uh, let me know how things are going in your life. I uh, hope to catch up with you soon. Take care and may God bless you. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Amen. I'm Brian Sixby. I'd like to welcome you here to worship on this uh, beautiful Sunday. A few things I wanted to mention. First, I didn't notice this in the bulletin. It says we have a single service next Sunday. That's not right. Uh, we have two services, but we are celebrating graduation Sunday at this service next Sunday. So, uh, and right there is one of our grads. She's, she's the featured one uh, today. So, uh, anyway, glad that you're here. Uh, please note that we, we have both services next Sunday just like normal, uh, but uh, this, uh, this service will be for graduation. Uh, if you have a graduate at home or, or, or in your family, uh, please, I don't know if it's in this week, but we can find you where we, we'd like to know who they are, where they're graduating from, and what their future plans are. It doesn't need to be an essay, just, just enough that we can share that with everybody. So if that's true for your family or for somebody you know, please Please share that with us. Uh, drop a note in the offering or something like that when it comes around uh, so that we can include them in, in Graduation Sunday. A uh, few other things I wanted to share as well. Last week I introduced the Vacation Bible School offering. Uh, that was to help cover primarily the cost of, of bringing the Navajo here for the summer uh, for uh, beginning of the week of July 10, July 10 through, uh, they're staying through the next Sunday, the 17th, and then they head back out the Monday. Uh, they wanted to do it all in one drive, by the way, which is 26 hours, uh, more or less, to, or 27 hours to drive. And they planned to do it all in one day without stopping. We said, no, we want you to stop. We, we don't want you to be completely dead when, when you get here. 
but uh, uh, we're looking forward to that. Last week we received 22.41 uh, and 45 cents uh, in the donations, and since then there have been $500 online given and several checks in, in uh, the offering. But if you weren't ready last week to make a donation, you can do it this week and, and perhaps for a couple more weeks as well. Uh, just mark your pew envelope VBS, or if you're doing it online, uh, note VBS in, in the online thing. Uh, and, and that will help us not just to, to cover the expense of Vacation Bible School and the Navajos coming in uh, per diem so that they uh, can afford to come, but it also helps set, uh, set the standard and, and set us in, in motion for an ongoing relationship with the Navajos uh, into the future. Uh, so those two things, three things now. Uh, so next Sunday is regular Sunday, two services. Uh, second, uh, graduation Sunday next week. And third, Vacation Bible School. Now moving on, uh, Monday is Finance and Council. Tuesday is VBS meeting. Thursday is Annual Conference. If you don't know what that is, I, that's okay. Annual Conference is the gathering of all the United Methodist Churches and Pastors from Virginia. Uh, this year it's going to be at the Hampton Coliseum. Uh, I do want to highlight uh, Thursday evening will be the memorial service, a re service of remembrance, and Friday evening will be the ordination service. Neither, if you haven't seen either one, it is worth your time coming to the Coliseum, to, not the Coliseum, the Convention Center to see it. Uh, if you want to drop in and, and see what it's like, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, and uh, Saturday, uh, we've got uh, two weddings and a funeral, at least I do. Uh, we, we're hosting Cindy and Mark's wedding at 2.30. At 4 o'clock, the family of Joyce Bezek will be here uh, for visitation, family time. And then at 5 o'clock will be the service for Joyce Bezek. Uh, then I'm heading off to Grandview Beach to do another wedding at 6.30. Uh, so it, it, for me, it's not the movie, but it, it's halfway there, right? Uh, was it four weddings and a funeral or something like that? Anyway. Um, and plus, I'd sign up to do a 5K in the morning. I don't know if I'm still going to do that. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, what that day brings. But uh, pray for me. I, I, I may be not quite in my right head and right, my right mind when, when next Sunday comes around. Uh, I also want to mention, we're starting, I'm starting a new sermon series called Wisdom of the Desert this week. Uh, and the, the main thrust of that is about uh, being present in the moment, being mindful, and being aware of God's providence, which to me, those two things are actually one of the same. If we're aware that God provides for us and has always provided for us, we're free to be in the moment that we're in. We'll talk today about why that matters and why it's important. And we often think about that as an Eastern concept. It's not. It's something that belongs to humanity uh, because it's part of the way that God wired us. So... I would invite uh, Jean, if you'll, Miss B, if you'll come up and uh, lead us in the call to worship. And if you're able to, please stand and we'll join together. We have a fairly small crowd here today, but I know there's still some folks out there on the TV land. So good morning to all of you. Will you join me now in the call to worship? It's rather short and sweet. One person's life is wonderful and... God is good. Another person's life is challenging, and God is good. So all the time, God is good. All the time. Thank you. Now we sta remain standing for the music.
technical difficulties. You hear it? I hear a little bit. I'm not a piano player.
You may be seated. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward. Uh, if you'll come and receive God's tithes and our offerings. There we go. Let's pray. Lord, you continually bless us and urge us to renew our spirits through the transformation of our minds so that we can know your good, acceptable, and perfect will. Your will is for us to produce fruit for your kingdom by loving you and our neighbors as ourselves. May these gifts be used to extend, extend your love, grace, and forgiveness to the people around us. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I invite the children to come for their time now. All those under the age of 111. I know we got some. Here's Tony. Children's time. All oh, the crew's coming in. Excellent. All right, so today we're talking about providence. You know what providence is? Oh, thank you for asking. Some, somebody paid him to do that, right? No, you did it. Thank you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So providence is, uh, the, the, the idea for providence is that God provides for us. So uh, the, the idea is, is that whatever our situation is, God provides. So earlier today... Uh, we were singing the songs, and Larissa's uh, piano wasn't playing at all, right? We, we knew she was pounding away on those keys, and she was doing beautiful music, but, but we couldn't hear it. So uh, is that a sign of God's providence? It actually is, right? Because we don't know what, what we need to know yet, right? But, but God has a purpose behind it. Maybe providence is if somebody saw this service, and they said online, hey, I'd love to hear Larissa, but I can't. Let me volunteer to help run the soundboard and, and figure out things. So that, that could be a way of God providing providence. It could be that, that because we couldn't hear her playing, we could hear her voice and we could hear Marie's voice better and somebody was really touched. Yeah, maybe more donation boxes. Yeah, that could, that could be part of the answer. But, but the idea is no matter what happens, God has providence in that moment. So uh, this is what I'd like you to kind of think about this week as you go through the week. Is it going to be a busy week for you? Last week of school. It's going to be a pretty busy week. Lots of things going on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so as you go through your week and, and you experience everything at school, just, just notice how God provides for you, okay? Just, just every day say, Lord, show me how you provide. And I bet by the end of every day, you're going to find at least one place where God provided for you exactly what you needed, okay? All right. And that's a challenge for the adults, too. Uh, okay. All right. Let, let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your providence, that, that you are always working in ways, sometimes ways we don't understand or don't see. Help us to trust in your providence so that we can rely on it each and every day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. As Miss Cindy leaves, I'll say congratulations, Miss Cindy. She's got a very special day coming up this Saturday. God bless. She's getting married, everybody. What would you do if Jesus were here and standing in front of you and you wanted to ask him, how do I get to heaven? What do you think he would say? Well, let's find out from Matthew 19, verses 16 through 31. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him then, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Then Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich man or person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your provision in all times and all places. You have even provided for this time. Give us ears to hear the word that you speak in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to tell you about the jackrabbit of doom. You know about the jackrabbit of doom, right? Well, let me explain what I mean. So uh, it's about two months ago, I, I traveled with my kids throughout southern Utah to, to some of the national parks out there. We picked up a camper van in Denver. Our first night, we needed a place to stay. We didn't have anything arranged. And, and so we needed someplace cheap. You can find RV places everywhere, but they're expensive. Uh, and, and I don't have that much money. So my son found this place in Jackrabbit Canyon, uh, which is at the western edge uh, of Colorado. And uh, it was free. It was a BLM property, not Black Lives Matter, Bureau of Land Management property. And uh, all we needed to do was, was go in and set up. They had bathrooms, uh, everything else, no running water, uh, but, but, but bathrooms and... Uh, uh, campsites and, and, and tables and all the rest. We get there close to midnight, uh, and, and it was cold. 
It had been cold through most of that trip, and, and that was the first night we realized we might not have planned well for this trip. But uh, we, we set up camp in, in the back of the van, and, and uh, uh, we got up the next morning, and, and there was frost on the inside. Nobody wanted to get out of bed, but the bathroom was calling, so we did, and we made it work. Anyway, we got out that day because my, my son said, there's some great trails around here. So we did some hiking before we left there. And uh, we came across uh, th this one place in the trail where there was these huge paw prints. Now, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a bear. It could have been a bear, but it was one dog on big dog, whatever it was. And, and I, I, you know, my mind sometimes goes wandering. And, and so I created this little myth and I said to my kids, this is the jackrabbit of doom. Right? And if you run across the jackrabbit of doom, it's a sign that the end is coming. The end is nigh. So you need to be ready uh, to meet the jackrabbit of doom. Well, we, we joked around it. And then later on at Arches, we had the platypus of, of Armageddon and so forth and so on. But uh, that, that sort of stayed in my mind for a little bit. Now, fast forward to just uh, about three weeks ago. I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was at a monastery, the Norvatine Monastery there, and, and they've got about a hundred acres of, of desert land, and, and I, I was doing what they call the meandering path of meditation, or the meandering meditative path. The idea, and it does meander around, it's about a half a mile, and uh, the idea is, is you can walk this path and uh, meditate on, on God's goodness, and, and that's what I was there to do, not just on the path, but for that part of the journey. And on my mind, I was thinking about that day. I was thinking about uh, the laundry I needed to do. I was thinking about the groceries I needed to get. I was thinking about the call I needed to make. I was thinking about all these things. And, and I was just, just full of my own thoughts. And as I was walking along, all of a sudden I heard a noise and I looked up and there's this big old jackrabbit. Now, they don't have bunnies like we have bunnies. And we've got some pretty big bunnies around, I've seen. But, but this, this is a jackrabbit. It's a different creature. Uh, we don't have kangaroos in our country, but this is as close as we get to them. Uh, that thing was that, no, that wasn't that tall. It's about that tall, about two and a half, maybe three feet tall. But it was big, and it hopped off so fast you could barely tell it was there after it was there. So I did the normal thing every human being does. I, I was startled. Right, and, and that fight or flight instinct kicks in and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? What do I need to do? And it, it runs away. And, and I, I realized after the fact how just delightful it was. It was delightful. It was, it was a wonderful little gift that I got in that moment. And then I got to thinking, well, if that was the jackrabbit of doom, I'm not ready. My mind's full of everything else except for what I need to be having my mind on, which is meditating with, with Jesus, walking with him through this path. And it got me to thinking about all the times that, that I am physically present, but I'm not present. You know what I'm talking about? All those times that I'm physically someplace, but I'm not in that place. I'm I'm mentally somewhere else. I'm emotionally somewhere else. I'm, I'm worried about the past. I'm fretting about the future. I'm not in that place in that time. And this happens, doesn't it? Uh, you could be at a, at a family event. Let, let's make it a wedding because we're doing so many weddings right now. You could be at a wedding and, and, and you're looking forward to seeing your family, seeing your friends, being together, enjoying this moment together. But instead, you're thinking about the flowers or you're thinking about the bouquet, you're thinking about, oh, I forgot to get this, or I forgot to get that, or, or why won't they do something like over here? Your mind is not in that moment. And so the moment passes and, and you're thinking, that just went right by me. That just passed right by me. Or, more to the point, uh, one of your children comes up to you and, and they have something they need to share with you. And, and while they're sharing, you're listening in one ear while the other ear is thinking about all the other stuff that's on your to-do list. I know no other parent does this. But, but you're, you're, you're not really paying attention to the child in the moment. And what do they really want? Well, they really probably just want you to be there and to listen. Now, I, I know a young child, typically, they're going to have a specific thing that they're after. But even young children... Sometimes what they really need is your presence. Not for you to solve all their problems, not for you to sort everything out, but for you to be there, for you to care about what they're going through. 
how many times have I not really been there for my kids? And even now, I sometimes struggle to, to be there for them. Or maybe you have a difficult conversation you need to have with somebody else. And so you enter into that conversation with the other person, and instead of paying attention to the conversation, you're thinking about how difficult this is, how hard it is, and how you flubbed it last time. And without even trying, you flub this one because you're not there. And what you really need is to be there, not to try to fix everything in the past, but to be there in the moment. We often think, at least I often think, when I hear the word mindfulness, I think, you know, Eastern religion sort of thing. No. We're talking our, our faith. This, this is Christianity. This, this is the, the faith you were brought up in, probably. Uh, it's in there. We don't necessarily notice it, but it's in the Bible. It's in the scriptures. It's not written in that way, but it's in there. So let's jump back to this man that talked to Jesus. Now, the, the title is often called The Rich Young Ruler, uh, but, but, you know, we don't have to necessarily put a title on it. We do know that this young man is rich. He's wealthy. Uh, he has means. He has possessions, more than most and more than probably just about everybody around him. He comes up to Jesus, and he asks a question. He says, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? As if there's one thing. Uh, some other translations read it. What one thing must I do to have eternal life? What, what's the one thing I need to do? And, and it, it's like he imagines in his mind there's one thing that, that I need to get. If I get that one thing right, I get everything else. I, I win the prize. I, I get the token. I, I get the, the grand poobah of all grand poobahs, and I get to go home happy. And so Jesus returns with a question, which is really not a bad way to do it. He says, well, you know the commandments, right? You know the commandments. Keep the commandments. And so the man asked, well, which ones? Now, when we think about commandments, we typically think the Ten Commandments. And we might add on to it the, the commandment to love God with our, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. We might think of 12 things. Well, as, as a young Jew in that place in that time, there were 616-some rules to keep. Now, he wouldn't have had to keep all of them unless he was a priest or married. So nobody had to keep the whole list, but everybody had some 600 rules to follow. Can you imagine that? And so he asked what is a legitimate question in that setting. Which ones? Do I have to keep them all? Right? Do I have to keep them all? And so Jesus lists kind of the most important ones. You know, honor your parents, don't steal, don't kill, uh, love God and love your neighbor. And the man replies, I've done all that. I've done all that. What do I still lack? What do I still lack? You know, that, that thought is like a splinter in the mind, isn't it? You, you get everything together, but you realize you're not quite there. You're, you're one French fry short of a Happy Meal. You know, the elevator stops just shy of the penthouse, and you need to get to the penthouse, but that elevator won't get you there. So how do you get to the right place to get to that penthouse? How do you get the French fry to make the Happy Meal complete? Because you know something's missing. Now, he expects the answer to be something simple. Like, for instance, he's wealthy. Maybe, maybe make a big donation to the synagogue, and, and, and then you're going to be good. But Jesus gives him what he doesn't expect. Sell everything that you have, give all that money to the poor, and then follow me. And he hangs his head and walks away. Now, I, I do want to stay off the bat. This is what Jesus said to this man. It's not necessarily what he would say to you or me. Because this, this man had wealth. 
and, and his wealth had him. He had possessions, but his possessions possessed him. Is I, I'm kind of reading into his psychology here, but, but this is what I imagine it goes something like this. He looks at his wealth, he looks at his possessions, and they say to him, you're loved, you're blessed, you've made it. You're secure. You don't have to worry. But they didn't really say that, did they? Because this funny thing happens on the way to accumulating wealth. How much do you need to be secure? A little bit more. A little bit more. How much more do you need to be happy? Well, a little bit more. A little bit more. How much more do you need? A little bit more. And, and so there's this self-perpetuating cycle. Whether we, we love money or anything else, it, it's always a self-perpetuating cycle. We get more, and then we need more. We need more, so we get more. We keep focused on getting more and more and more. Money is not going to tell us that we're beloved. It's going to tell us that we have money. Possessions aren't going to tell us that our lives are good. They're going to tell us that we have possessions. Years ago, I, I did a, uh, I, for about three years, I, I went into the, the, the jail in Franklin County uh, with another gentleman, and we led Bible study there. Uh, and, and this gentleman uh, told me about his brother multiple times. Uh, and his brother had done really well for himself. He, he'd started a business and for years and years struggled, but eventually the business took off. And then he started collecting artwork and, and putting it around his home and, and, and buying expensive, more and more expensive pieces of art. So then he installed a security system because he didn't want that art to be stolen. And then he didn't trust the security system, so he basically had barricaded himself in his own home because he was afraid that somebody might take something of his. He didn't have that art. The art had him. The same way this man that we meet doesn't have his wealth, his wealth has him. But something has each one of us, if we're honest. Each one of us is possessed by something. And for many of us, that something is the reason why we worry about the past and fret over the future. It's something we can't let go of. The point I want to make, and if you get the point, you can tune out, but I, I invite you to keep listening, is that God provides for everything we need. And God has provided and God will provide. He's even provided his own son for our salvation, forgiveness of sins. And so we don't need to worry about the past because the past is forgiven. We don't need to fret about the future because it's not here. We need to plan. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we don't need to worry and fret. What we need to do is walk with him today. Because that's the one thing I wasn't doing on that path. I was walking with my thoughts. I was walking with my preoccupations. I was walking with my worries. But I wasn't walking with Jesus. I, I didn't unintentionally, inadvertently pushed him out because everything else crowded in. One of the things I learned by being out west for so long and I've been out west. Some of you have lived out west as well. And by the way, this is Shiprock uh, on the reservation. Uh, we're about five, six miles away from it here. I did have to zoom in a little bit to make it clear. Uh, and, and this was one of the clear days there. there. Most days the wind was blowing so hard that it, it was hazy and shadowy. And it still is a little bit. But uh, that's Shiprock. If, if you come with uh, the team that we hope to send next year, you'll get to see it in person. Uh, but when I was out in the desert, I, I started to pay attention to it more than I had other times I'd been there. When you live here in Virginia and you go to the southwest, 
the, the desert southwest, the, the high desert is really what most of it's called uh, because it is high in al altitude. Uh, it, it's different. You don't have the trees. You, you sometimes get the scrub bushes, but you know things are about yay tall. So if you're used to trees giving you shade and shadow, well, you don't get it out there. And, and, and we're used to having a profusion of life. We, we could go outside and, and mark off a square of land and we could count how much life is on that land and we pro we're going to need more than all the hands and feet that we possess. Uh, looking at all the grass, all the trees, everything that's in that square of land, you go out to the desert, you could do the same thing and you'll probably just need your hands and your feet. But there is life. And what's remarkable is that God provides for the life that's there. And God even provided for human life. People have lived on the desert long before there was air conditioning, long before there was running water, long before there were septic systems, long before there were cars, long before there were all the things that we take for granted today. God provides. There is a way to survive. We need to be smart. We need to plan. You don't just head off for a hike in a place like this and not think about carrying your water, your food, other things that you need. But you also don't need to carry everything that you're going to need for the next 20 years, do you? You carry what you need for the day or for however long that trip is. God provides, but we still have a responsibility to do some planning. That's different than worrying and fretting. That's different than 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 not being in the moment. God provides in every time and every situation. And what was remarkable to me meeting the Navajo is how they knew about God's provision. Now, picture this. You live in a landscape not too dissimilar from this. And you can actually farm on some parts, not this part here. This one wouldn't farm for, for squat, but there are places there on the reservation that, that you can farm. But they tell you, you can grow things there, but don't eat it. Because uranium has spoiled the water. And you can get water piped into your home, and you can take a shower in it, but don't drink that water because it's been polluted by the uranium mines. Now, this is the reality most of them live with. There are some places where the water is just fine. But many of the places on the reservation, the water isn't just fine. Can you imagine living off bottled water every day, which is what they have to do to survive, to not get sick, to, to make it into their 40s and 50s, much less 70s and 80s? And you would think that if that was your life, you'd be bitter, you'd be angry, you'd be upset. But, but many of them told me and, and have told Becky and the others who go visit, we're not going to hold on to that bitterness. We're not going to hold a grudge. We're not going to keep it against them because it's not worth it. In the meantime, God provides. We have water that's safe. And we can grow and look forward to the day we can eat it. God provides. Being mindful is another way of saying you believe in God's providence. Because if God provides, you don't need to worry about the past. You don't need to fret about the future. You deal with the day as a day comes. So the, the rich young ruler thought that he had it all together because his wealth protected him. He didn't realize that his wealth protected him from the one thing he needed, which was a relationship with Jesus. That's the one thing you can't buy. But you can have it by being present with him. It's all you need. He's made a way. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. So when you come to the altar, whether you do it in your mind or whether you do it physically, and you say, I'm a sinner, 
or I have sinned, please forgive me. God provides. Leave it at the altar. Don't take it back with you. Don't keep chewing on it. Don't keep mulling over it. Learn whatever lesson you need to learn and move on because God provides. The man thought that he needed to do something to earn heaven. What he needed to do was stop and let God be God and walk with the Lord. Likewise, when I was out there wandering in the desert, the one thing I needed was the one thing I didn't possess. And that was a, a mind walking with Christ. So I walked out there by myself until Christ surprised me with a jackrabbit. Whether it was a jackrabbit or doom or not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Let, let me tell you a couple more stories. So these two monks were traveling from one monastery to another monastery, and, and in their order, things were pretty strict. They, they were not to talk. Uh, there were only prescribed times when they could talk, and they were not to touch women. It was that kind of monastery. So, so they're out walking from one to the other, and at one point about midday, they, they reach a, a crossing of a stream, and, and there's a woman at one side of the stream, and, and it's clear that she wants to cross, but she doesn't know how. And, and it turns out she didn't know how to swim, so she's worried that she might fall in. So the one monk talked to her and said, hey, do you need to get across? And she said yes and explains the situation. He picks her up and carries her, places her on the other side of the bank, and they all go their own separate ways. They get to the monastery, knock on the door, and while they're waiting, the one monk turns to the other and says, why did you talk to that woman? You know you're not supposed to do that. You talked to her, and then you touched her. You picked her up. Why'd you do that? And the other monk said, I put her down five miles ago. Why are you still carrying her? I put her down miles ago. Why are you still carrying her? The other story is the Apostle Paul. We, we read in, in his writings that, that he had a thorn in the flesh that he prayed for God to remove. We don't know what that thorn was. We can speculate all we want, but we don't know what it was. We just know that there was something that, that made him weak. Something he was aware of that perpetually made him weak. And he prayed for God to remove it. And, and we often forget what God said. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So each one of us has some kind of thorn, some kind of weakness, some place where we know we are incomplete, where we know we're lacking, like this rich young man knew something was lacking in his life. The purpose is not to get rid of that. The purpose is to let God fill it. It's a God-shaped hole. It's a Jesus-shaped thorn. We're to let him fill it day by day, right? Because we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer in a bit, right? And, and we pray, uh, give us this day our bread for the next 25 years. Is that what we pray? Daily bread. Daily bread. Daily bread. For a daily walk. What's needed is not some amazing act of courage or power or strength or wealth or anything like that. What's needed is a daily walk, bringing him with us, letting him talk to us, listening for his voice as we go about our day because his grace is sufficient and his power is perfected in our weakness. What if the one thing we need is the one thing we can do right now? Walk humbly with your God. 
Let's pray. Lord, forgive us for all those times when, when we look around, what we see is not your provision, but our weakness. Teach us to trust in you, in your provision, in your guidance, in your word, in your love, so that we can walk today and in the successive days humbly with you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, we pray that your goodness will be all apparent in, to every individual. By your grace, the splendor of the banner is overflowing with the love of your presence. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. Your creation gladly seeks opportunity to sing your praises. For some, life is difficult to say the least. For others, life in a fast lane could not be packed with more good experiences. Yet, by your great mercy, we survive the good and the bad, still madly in love with you, proved by our commitment and value. Yes, God is good all the time. Father of our Lord Jesus, Savior, surely our impetuous, unthinking immaturity must certainly cause you to caution us. Slow down and think how grand it is and how grand it would be if only we could first follow the direction waiting for us in the Holy Spirit. The end result of our labor is not to make us feel satisfied. Is it not what we do for you that helps build the kingdom? Would not our bond with you be made lastingly solid? Is not this which would bring about satisfaction, your satisfaction in us? We follow the dictates of our secular lives, thinking that is what you want. But somehow, somehow we get the feeling that it is not what you want at all. Father, build in us an openness to your word, a willingness to obtain our direction from you. This too, to bring about the ultimate meaning of our salvation. O oh, Father, creator, maker of all things, <clears throat> through your Son you have made that which seems impossible turn into the greatest of all spiritual adventures. <clears throat> we, we wonder, we wonder what we have to do to, to gain immortality. And in the sum of your wisdom, the answer is not do, the answer is be. We'll give our assumption that the ultimate can be earned. The word identifies salvation as a gift given only through the belief in Jesus and the acceptance of the forgiveness of one's sins. Then comes the ultimate question, what lack I yet? Go and take care of that which stands as an obstacle to following Jesus, then go in the direction the Holy Spirit leads. Cleanse the thoughts of our minds. Make them to become a garden of divine creativity. In Jesus' name, we pray the prayer he taught us. Now, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our benediction this week is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, so I invite you to take your time. I'm going to take my time with it. Uh, by the way, I pull these all from the New Testament, so uh, you are reading scripture when you say these benedictions, uh, but I invite you to stand and, and let's say this together. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort our hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Go in peace.